You're listening to the Telegraph Cycling Podcast, presented by Trainer Road, cycling's most effective training tool. Yeah, it's been a huge year for me, you know, winning E3 and such a great tour, getting married, honeymoon, book coming out and everything. But um, yeah, I think the highlight has to be winning a podcast Pedal de Cham award, for sure, that t-shirt. Uh, try to place my wardrobe. This is only the beginning. You can't even imagine what we are going to do for the future. With exclusive interviews and the best analysis on two wheels, this is the Telegraph Cycling Podcast. My name's Richard Moore, and in this week's Cycling Podcast, we are going to hear from two of the world's leading female riders, Lucy Garner and Lizzie Armistead. Before we do that, though, let's hear from Lionel Burney with his weekly news roundup. Over to you, Lionel. Thank you, Richard. I'm just off up to Derby Velodrome for a not-so-secret day of training on the track ahead of our trainer road race at the end of March. But before I go, I've just got time to update everyone on what's been going on in the world of professional cycling over the last week or so. First of all, the Tour of Oman. Vincenzo Nibali, the Italian champion, won the stage on Green Mountain to set up his first stage race overall victory since the 2014 Tour de France. It was a very strong week for the Norwegian riders. Alexander Kristoff took his fourth and fifth victories of the season when he won stages, and Edval Bosenhagen, his compatriot, won a couple of stages as well. Down in the south of Portugal, Geraint Thomas won the Volta al Algarve for the second year in a row. Big name winners left, right and centre this week because Marcel Kittel took his fourth and fifth victories of the season, winning a couple of bunch sprints. Alberto Contador got his first victory of the season and Fabian Cancellara won the time trial in Algarve. That was the 57th individual time trial win of his professional career. Over in southern Spain at the Ruta del Sol, Alejandro Valverde won that race for the fourth time. TJ Van Garderen won the time trial there and there was a sprint victory for Nasser Buhani. And in the south of France at the Tour du Haut Var, a two-day stage race, um, Cannondale's Tom Yelta Slagsa won a stage and Arthur Vichot won the second stage to take the overall title. Away from the races, rumours are building that Prince Nasser bin Hamid Al Khalifa of the Bahrain Royal Family is planning a World Tour level team for the 2017 season and that Vincenzo Nibali is top of his shopping list. And finally, we were saddened to hear that former Eurosport commentator David Duffield had passed away at the weekend, aged 84. For those who watched coverage of cycling on Eurosport in the 1990s or early 2000s, Duffield was the voice of cycling. Duffers, as he was affectionately known, had a unique and often amusing turn of phrase. During long stints in the commentary box, often without a co-commentator, he would sometimes go off at a tangent talking about the food or the wine, which could sometimes be exasperating for the hardcore bike racing fan. But Duffield never forgot that his audience was broad and it was not solely made up exclusively of bike racing obsessives. What was never in doubt was his passion for the sport. Here's one of his most famous bits of commentary. It's from the 1992 Milan San Remo. The crowd at the finish have just been told that Kelly's caught Arnon Town. They can't see what you can see, and they've gone, oh. The depression set in at the moment in the finishing arena, and they're all peering anxiously down to see. And look at the gap now. The, the Telefoxo lens is for shortening the gap. It's not as close as you would think, but it's still enough for that big punch. If the bunch really start to roll, they might catch these two in front. In the red and the yellow on the front, that's Benino Argentan. In the blue behind him is Sean Kelly from Ireland. Kelly now begin to wind it up. Argentan in front of him. Swinging round the corner, the crowd now can see that they're Man is on the front, the Italian versus the Irish, and he cuts across uh, Kelly, but down got the crash behind when well, the Motorola boys have gone down with the back. I think Thomas has gone as well, and Kelly's going away, Kelly's going to get it, Kelly gets it, Sean Kelly, the winner of the 83rd Milan San Remo, what a way, 6 hours, 26 minutes and 23 seconds of racing, and Kelly is back with a bang, and this lot are down likewise with a bang, and yes, I thought it was Motorola that bit the dust, bad luck for them, but good luck for the Irishman himself. You're listening to the Telegraph Cycling Podcast with Richard Moore, Lionel Burney and Daniel Freib. Thank you for that, Lionel. Now, as I said, we're hearing in this episode from Lizzie Armstead and Lucy Garner 
Garner, of course, is the former double junior world champion, and Armistead is the current world road race champion, having won a memorable race in Richmond, Virginia last September. Armistead will make her 2016 debut at Head Newsblad this weekend, and a week later, she will be one of the riders riding Strada Bianchi, the first event in the inaugural UCI Women's World Tour Series. We're going to hear from Lucy, then from Lizzie, then Lucy again, then Lizzie again, and then Lucy again, and so on. You get the picture. But I went recently to southern Spain to catch up with the two of them separately. Lucy Garner in Calpe, where she was training, and Lizzie Armistead just along the coast in Morera, where she was training. And I started talking to Garner about Armistead. A 21-year-old Garner was part of the British team that helped Armistead win her world title in Richmond. And so I asked her, what is the world champion like as a leader? Yeah, even just when you're around her, you can feel the sort of how professional she is. She, she's so driven. Um, she knows what she needs to do. She, d I think she's quite a very independent person as well. Like she does a lot of her training herself. I know that. And yeah, she just sets a goal, and she she can just seem to do it. Like she'll go away, you don't see her racing for a while, and she'll come back, and she'll be like five times as, as amazing as she was before so yeah she definitely has sort of a big role and I think as well like at the world championships this last year we were yeah a young team and <clears throat> she really made us all come together and just really believe that we could we could help her and do something for her which was really nice. What, what, how does she lead I mean does is she somebody who sort of stands up and gives you a talk beforehand or does she speak to you individually does she put her arm around you does she give you very detailed instructions how does she how does she operate? Well, she knows what she wants, so she, yeah, well, we all have the team meeting, and then <clears throat> she said the plan that she <clears throat> she wanted to do, and then she said, okay, maybe you can do this, maybe you can do that, and yeah, at the end of the day, she knows how she will perform, and she is like, she's the best in the world, so it's just us trying to do what we can for her, but yeah, she's very relaxed as well, She, I, I never saw her sort of get really stressed or anything, she's just very calm collected and yeah cool so we heard there from lucy garner talking about lizzie armistead let's hear now from armistead herself last year she had a, a difficult winter she admitted after the disappointment of missing out on a world title that seemed to be hers for the taking in pomferrada so i asked her what has life been like this winter having finally won the rainbow jersey uh phew, hard in different ways i suppose yeah last year i had a, a really hard time dealing with the disappointment because i'd gone into that world championships with incredible form so physically I was capable of doing it and if you go into a race and you get the tactics wrong you can't really go away and work harder on it like if it was a physical problem then I'd go away train harder and I'd be better but I got the tactics wrong so it was it was a huge disappointment and um, to be honest I probably didn't switch off enough last off season I worked really hard I probably had about two weeks off the bike after the world championships not enough this year has been very different. I had a lot longer off the bike, um, but I was a lot busier. So I don't know what's been better preparation, but um, yeah, it's been a hard winter again. But the, last year you almost seemed to be soul searching. You know, you'd done everything as you say right. You were in great condition physically, and it hadn't it hadn't gone right on the day. And one day racing is is where your heart lies, isn't it? Really, and so much can go wrong. Um, were you sort of doubting last? winter whether all the, the sacrifice all the work was was actually worth it yeah definitely that's but at the same time that's why I love cycling I love that aspect of it that's why I chose road racing over track racing there's that kind of mystery about it and the unknown about it anything can happen and that's what I love about the sport so I came to terms with the fact that I lost and just kept plugging away I, I don't think world champions are lucky um you know you do have to work hard for it and just keep plugging away and you'll get there I suppose and has it, has it been a sort of opposite feeling this winter where it did all go right and you said how in control you felt on, on the day um, you felt the race was yours for the taking it all went, you were you were in great physical condition, it all went right tactically um, has that given you has that sort of made you more relaxed about, about your sport and more in control I think so, yeah. I think with age as well, you get this kind of perspective on it. Um, and I suppose it's become more of my job now and I'm able to switch off from it more. I suppose, yeah, self-belief's um, been hugely improved because obviously I'm self-coached as well. It's sometimes difficult to know whether I'm, what I'm doing is right. Um, 
but it was kind of a validation of everything that I've done, I suppose. Being self-coached does make you quite unusual. Um, is there, and you've been, you know, part of the British system in the past. In terms of how that works, do you are you somebody who who devises or designs a program that you follow, or is it very much done on sort of feel on instinct? No, it's it's. I think people often get it wrong and they think oh she's self coached that means that she doesn't have structure and that's not the case I have complete structure and um, just like anyone who has a coach I just I'm the coach part so yeah I plan out my training in advance and analyze it afterwards just like a coach would how do you do that I mean how and how far in advance do you do that and what what are the what's the sort of philosophy behind it do you read do you do you speak to people where do you get your your knowledge your information from yeah I'm really interested in uh, physiology um i read a lot um i suppose i'm a bit like a sponge i listen to people around me soak up the information take from it what i want um yeah i phase plan at the start of the season so i look at my race program um i discuss that quite closely with danny stan my director and then kind of fit in the training probably two weeks in advance i'll I'd, I'd plan it i suppose what a lot of people like about having a coach is that they can sort of pass a bit of responsibility to the coach you know and also it takes away the question every morning what will I do today you know you've only got to explain a missed training session to yourself rather than to a coach does that make it does that make it harder in some senses I just really struggle giving away that responsibility I think where I'm in a really unique position doing the job I do that it's such a selfish thing really at the end of the day it's totally about um my victory um, that's all you know that's everything I do all the sacrifices I make are really quite selfish it's all about me so um, I didn't want to give that responsibility away to someone else I think I know my body better than anyone else and I trust myself to to get myself in the best shape but <laughs> sorry to go back to this I'm, I'm thinking about you know how how easy it is to talk yourself out of uh, to, to rationalise maybe having an easier day or you know, if you if you'd planned a, a four-hour ride and you're maybe feeling wake up feeling not 100 percent, you can sort of talk yourself around into doing something else. Is that is that a constant conversation that goes on in your head, or are you quite good at just sticking to the plan that you've devised? Uh, I suppose it used to be when I was younger and probably not as committed as I should have been. Uh, but now, no, it's the opposite problem. I probably do too much and I miss having that coach sometimes to tell me to hold back and rest and not panic. And, you know, I suppose from a mental perspective, it's I do miss sometimes that reassurance of a coach, but I'm also a really bad communicator. I don't pick up my phone very often. So the idea of having to ring up somebody every day and discuss how my legs were feeling is just a bit tedious for me. And you, you're somebody who trains on your own most of the time, aren't you? You live in Monaco. There's, there's obviously a lot of cyclists who live there. Um, big, uh, big groups go training there. But what's the reason for for wanting to train on your own? I just really see it as my job. So when I'm on the bike, I want to be making the best of it. So I want it to be quality all the time. I don't want junk miles. Um, there's plenty of time for that after my career to kind of enjoy the bike again. But um, I've only got a short career and I want to make the most of it. So every time I'm on the bike, I'm pushing the wind, basically. What well, I mean, what's Monaco like? You've been there a few years now. Um, I suppose people have a will have an image of it as a very glamorous place. Lots of glamorous people. I mentioned the the group rides. There's a there's a sense maybe some riders go there and don't do as well as they should because they fall into that mm-hmm. habit of you know doing the the easier group rides perhaps rather than the the, the pushing the wind themselves. Um, but how do you, you obviously manage that side of it very well but life in general what's it like in Monaco compared to Otley <laughs> yeah Otley and Monaco are very different um, both have got their, their strong points Monaco's strong point would be the weather and the food um, you, you know year round sunshine has made a huge yeah, difference to my career to be honest just that being able to ride every day in the mountains in the sun undoubtedly has had a positive impact the people there in Monaco, yeah, of course, you know, it's the rich and the famous there, but I'm a very small fish in that pond, and it's quite nice because I found a genuine set of friends, all quite like-minded, all there for the same reason, um, sports people. So, yeah, I, I really like it. I don't think I'll settle there long-term, but as a cyclist, it's a good place to be. 
I don't get the impression you'd be that easily impressed by some of the famous people there. Would that be a correct impression? <laughs> uh, yeah, no, it's not really my scene, to be honest. You're um, not doing selfies or collecting autographs? Oh, I can't stand selfies. As soon as selfies die out, I'll be a happy woman. So Lizzie Armitstead, not a huge fan of the craze for selfies. Let that be a warning to you. Let's hear now from Lucy Garner again, who changed teams over the winter, moving to Wiggle High Five. She has ridden for a Dutch team since turning pro. So why did she feel the time was right for a change? I think it was just a time for me to change. I got to the point where I I wasn't sort of progressing as much as I wanted. And yeah, I was, the girls were great on the team. But I just thought, yeah, I really just want a different move and I think yeah Wiggle were really interested in me even though sort of at the start of the season I had a lot of problems with my knees and couldn't do a lot of the races um, Wiggle was still really passionate and wanted me on the team and yeah it, it's a great team and it's like <clears throat> now ranked number one so yeah it's a good team to be on definitely. Well, I mean is there going to be a different role for you there uh, will there be an opportunity to, to lead the the team races they've obviously got some very strong riders some some winners on that team but will you have a sort of different different role there do you think I think I think so but I think it will be it will really bring me on um, I'm a sprinter so I can learn a lot from the sprinters on the team and yeah I, I just think that if I can sort of race the final without actually sprinting I can learn a lot from that um, because I've found being with Liv I was doing a lot of the finals but not <clears throat> necessarily knowing what I was doing so I think that I can learn a lot by sort of being the last lead out girl for Jolene or yeah Bronzini and just yeah really trying to develop my engine and then then work on the sprint at the final yeah I mean you're still only 21 you, you came into the senior ranks as a double junior world champion it's always difficult to to take that step up but it must be especially difficult when you come in with that sort of reputation and when you're used to winning at the, at the highest level. How difficult was it, n- not not even so much physically, but, but mentally, to, to go from winning races to, to, to learning all over again? It was the hardest thing that I think that I've had to face, actually, in my life. It was really, really tough. And obviously, as well, like, I'd move countries and moved, compl- like, the whole surrounding and everything sort of, was completely different so yeah the first year it was really hard like mentally and like I went to my first race and as soon as we got to the first like little hill I was just spat out the back and then you think to yourself okay yeah this is this is completely different playing field that you're in and yeah you for me it took I think over a year to really like get that click and I think for me it was just really really important to set my own goals because obviously as a junior I was just going there to win, but now it's like, okay, you've got to make sure you can survive until the second climb. Just goals like that, and then then you start to see the results and you can sort of, yeah, reward yourself rather than feeling disappointed all the time. So when you turn senior and, and you, you were told that in three years this is where you'll be, this is the, the, the point you'll be at, would you have... Are you happy that that you're progressing at the at the rate that you you know that you thought you would progress at the year that you wanted to progress at? In some ways, yes, and in some ways, no. I think in terms of the bike, I feel like I probably could have got a bit more out of myself last year. Um, of course, I can't always blame the knee problems, but I just think, yeah, I just need a bigger engine. So that's what I'm really trying to work on this year. And I think, yeah, being with Wiggle, there's a lot of experienced riders, and even on the training camps that we were doing, like it was a good pace that we were riding at. I can feel like I know that I can improve in the team. So, yeah, that's what I need really the engine and then yeah because the sprint I always think it's like something that you can't really lose if you're a sprinter then it's yeah you've always got it and you can try and improve on it so this is the Telegraph Cycling Podcast join us on Twitter and Facebook just search online for the Cycling Podcast so we heard there from Lucy Garner on her early years as a pro She's a rider of great promise, of course, a few years behind Lizzie Armstead, who we're about to hear from again. Here she is talking about the responsibility of being world champion, wearing the rainbow jersey, and the attention that comes with it. It's a bit of a weird one, really, because the reason I started cycling was because of my love of cycling and my love of winning, and then you kind of have this almost like a responsibility in my position, especially with women cycling, with the way it's, in, you know, trying to get exposure. You kind of have to take responsibility for that and engage in that media stuff and 
to be honest, it doesn't come that naturally to me. Um, it's not something that I crave. I don't crave the attention, but um, I suppose, yeah, it's part of the job. Can you get away with maybe putting on a black jersey one day and not, not bothering with the rainbow jersey? Do you, have, you know, you have to wear it every day, but are you ever tempted just to wear something a bit more anonymous? Yeah, definitely. I was really, really sick over Christmas. I had a chest infection and in the first couple of days back, I just didn't feel like I deserved to be riding in it, to be honest. I was that slow. I just wanted to be anonymous. I didn't want people hanging on my back wheel and feeling like I had to ride faster. You can tell us whether you did that or not, or maybe not. You don't want to get in trouble. Um, you haven't raced yet this year, obviously, but the season is is almost upon us. Um, you will have that that jersey. It's sort of like a target almost on your back. What what do you think that will feel like? Good. Um, I mean, I race well under pressure. I always need pressure to do well, so that's a good thing. Um, I understand where this curse of the yellow, the yeah, I was going to say yellow jersey. That's wrong. <laughs> the curse of the rainbow jersey has come from, um, and it's not about some ridiculous curse. It's just the fact that you, you do have this pressure and you have a busy winter, and all those things add up. So I'm hoping that I've managed that well, and I'll just approach the races like I did last year the same same way. Both Lizzie and Lucy have left behind the British system to forge their own paths in women's road racing on the continent. Armistead currently rides for the Dutch team Bulls Dolmans. But this was a path to the continent that Lucy seemed determined to follow from a young age. I asked her how she got into the sport in the first place. Well, my dad was really passionate about riding his bike and so was, yeah, so was my uncle and they did a lot of just, yeah, local cyclocross races and things like that and I always went to watch and I tried so many different sports but I thought, yeah, cycling was pretty different, no one really did it and that's something what... <clears throat> what made me want to do it again but yeah I just really like being out on my bike and you can just go wherever you want kind of thing and yeah my dad used to take me on really nice trails and all things like that and I just like being out in the open um, rather than sort of stuck inside. Were there any I mean as you got into the fungus were there any female riders that you, you looked up to or male riders that you looked up to? When I first started um, I was quite like well, I was quite big on the track, so I did a lot of that. So I looked up to Victoria Pendleton a lot. I thought she was really glamorous and was cycling really well. So, yeah, I really liked that. Um, and, yeah, when I started being, like, under 16, it was sort of Mariana Voss because she was doing every discipline that I was doing. And, yeah, everyone looks at me like she's such a good role model for young women, young girls. So I mean, being a sprinter, you're obviously a road rider, but, you know, you've got the, the sprint. Um was the track something that, that interested you, maybe not as a sprinter, but as an endurance rider on the track? Was that something that you, you were tempted by? Um, it was at the start, yeah. I did a lot of the lot on the track, and obviously yeah, I did a lot of the Hales Owen leagues and things like that. And then I was part of the talent team, and you just move, yeah, going from talent team to then ODP, they are quite track-based, so you are made to do quite a lot of track. So then yeah I was doing a lot of training and I had quite a successful junior sort of at the Europeans and things like that but I just found that I loved the road a lot more I loved just being able to go out and just ride wherever than riding in circles and, and you did it you, you did it the old school way of you know going to the continent and, and basing yourself there what was that like making that that move across and, and again why you know that there is an opportunity for British riders now to be very well looked after as part of the British system why did you why were you tempted to, to take a different path? It was actually my dream. Like, I always wanted to sort of move move to Holland, actually, and be a professional racer. So, yeah, it was a risk, but it was something that I was willing to, willing to take. And, yeah, I was lucky enough to have a successful junior career. And then, obviously, Argos came along, and it was a really big team. And I thought, I can't miss this opportunity just to get stuck in with the women's peloton and just see. And if it didn't work, it didn't work. But... I just yeah, I didn't want to give up that quick. And you were saying earlier that you you feel you feel almost more Dutch or you feel more at home in Holland than you than you do in the UK now. Yeah, definitely. It's yeah, it's really nice to be there. And obviously, I, it, it's coming up to like three and a half years now that I've been there. So yeah, I'm learning the language. Well, I was going to say, how's your Dutch? <laughs> yeah, I can I can understand. Give us a blast of Dutch. Oh, no, oh no, no, I don't know what to say. <laughs> yeah, now I can't do it like that, but. 
no like if we're on the start line then they can't talk about me now the Dutch so I can understand what they're saying but no I'm still a little bit shy speaking it but no it's really nice and obviously I've got Lars there and his family and I've got my own friends and it is yeah a whole new life there now become a friend of the podcast for 2016 for 10 pounds you'll have access to our friend specials 11 in-depth episodes that will take you even further inside the sport all our friend specials are now available on your mobile device our 2015 friend specials are also still available for five pounds to sign up visit www.thecyclingpodcast.com lizzie can i take you right the way back to when you started cycling you were famously sort of talent spotted as a as a as a young kid i don't know if i've ever actually heard the story from you about what exactly happened that day Yes, yeah, so the Olympics were announced in London uh, and a British cycling initiative happened where they went into schools looking for kids who had potential on a bike. So luckily enough, they came to my school. Basically, a van full of bikes, a couple of cones around the school field and a race. And I did it to get out of the lesson. And um, yeah, from there I went on to a programme. I was given a coach and a bike. Did you ride a bike much prior to that? No, I mean, I rode a bike playing out as a, as a kid, but I didn't own a bike from about the age of 10 to 15. It's not what teenage girls spent the money on, you know. Um, so it didn't really grab my imagination. The, the 500 quid lottery funding is what got me into it, to be honest. But, you know, that was more than I was earning waitressing. So that's what I did. And what was it, I mean, was, was it talent? Was it obvious? Was it, was it something that you felt you had, a, you know, something that you were good at? Mm. I mean, in that initial race was it something that you felt oh I I can do this I mean I was a good runner and I was a good all-round athlete I was kind of in all the school teams but I was never the best at anything and I really feel that cycling was the first sport that I was the best at yeah so when did the the bug bite was it a case of your appreciation enjoyment of the sport growing as you realised you were you were better at it, or did was there was there a moment where you you started to to quite like the sport? Did you watch the racing? I went to watch a track world cup in Manchester, and I saw Chris Hoy and Vicky Pendleton, and um, the crowds and sort of the the glamour and the excitement, and and started to learn more about cycling, I suppose, and the history and the tradition involved, and I just I fell in love with it that way, yeah, mm. and. Um, and then I saw that I could make a career out of it, and that's when I started to take it more seriously. And what what sort of age and what stage were you, you at then? Were you still at school when you when you sort of started having designs on on becoming a professional? Yeah, I was junior, um, so I was on the junior British track program, and there was this under twenty three program that you could get on if you got results, and that was kind of my aim. Instead of university, I wanted to move to Manchester to the track. And when did uh, road racing get under your skin? Very quickly, actually. Um, I mean, I liked the sort of straightforwardness of the track, that if you put in the work, then generally you came out with a medal if you're part of that British cycling setup. But then I loved the unpredictability and the travel and the sort of the, the new, a new team every year, new teammates, all those different things that you get on the road. And I, I just loved road racing and you know you mentioned that you know you, you coach yourself you're very much uh, um, your own person um, what was it like being part of that British setup that that you know that system was very well established with by the time Chris Hoy Vicky Pendleton were performing as they were and you know through Beijing and so on there was a real machine there mm-hmm. um, how did you find life within the, that machine um I didn't like it very much, yeah. Uh, I liked it when I was a points race rider and the points race was in the Olympics and that was the aim um, because you could combine it with the road and the track. But then it turned to the Omnium and the team pursuit and you became really part of it. You had to become part of a team in so many ways that you had to train as a unit every day and do very similar training to each other. And I just didn't like that aspect of it. I felt like I wasn't fulfilling my training needs as an individual. And... It's very sort of same routine, same track every day, same circles every day, and I just struggle with that. I've, it wasn't the beauty of cycling, that kind of romantic view of being out and 
chasing your dreams in the in the beautiful scenery. That's what I missed. Mm. Um, so you're quite, you know, you're quite pragmatic in some ways, but also quite romantic in 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 your attitude towards your cycling. Would you say a combination of the two? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, a definite combination. Like I still would prefer to go out and not use a Garmin and a power meter. I would prefer to go out and just ride my bike and and suffer and mm. and then have a look up and see where I've got to yeah definitely I mean quite a few guys have come out of the, the British setup Dan Martin um, the Yates brothers people like that and, and done pretty well because there's a there's a pathway for, for men it's, it's harder for women isn't it to step out of that machine because all the support that's there for you as, as a woman is harder to find perhaps in the in the outside of the British cycling system I suppose so but as a British woman if you're uh, dream lies on the road then actually it's probably easier than being a British man because if you're a British man on the road then you would probably, the easiest path would be to get onto Team Sky and do it that way and there isn't that for a British woman so you do have to go out into Europe and find your team that way mm. but I don't think it's necessarily harder, it's just different. Nevertheless I guess th- it was a risk to, to do your own thing Yeah it was, Yeah, I mean when I decided to focus on the road it was going into Olympic year if I'd have stayed on the track then hopefully I would have been in that team pursuit team and come away with a medal and a medal was definitely not sure at that point on the road but I was in a position where I could do I I could choose a career that I loved or stay in something that I didn't love and I'd seen a lot of Olympic medalists actually who'd won gold medals and weren't that happy along the way and I prefer to enjoy the journey to an Olympic medal. Mm. So, you know, you did come away with a silver medal in London. Um, had you stuck the track, you might have had a gold medal. But I guess you don't look back on that with any sort of regret, do you? No, definitely not. I mean, the girls in that Team Pursuit team deserved that gold and all credit to them because, it's like I say, it's not just about putting in the time on the bike. It's so much more when you're up in Manchester. It's high pressure, and I don't know if I could have done that, to be honest. I needed my own path, and I needed to do the road. So no way, I, I'm very proud of that silver. Do you ever look back on that on the road race? Mariana Voss was such an outstanding favourite. And I didn't realise, you're, you're actually very close in age to, to Voss. She just seems to have been around forever. Um, and I'll speak about her in a moment. But, you know, that was an outstanding ride. It was the second day of the Olympic Games. You were you got all the headlines, Queen Elizabeth on the Times, I remember. The wrap around on the Times. Um, but do you ever look back on that? sprint and 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 think maybe maybe it could have it, the gold medal could have been mine no i mean there was there was one point that i could have done differently my instinct actually was about two seconds before she made her jump i had an instinct to duck up the inside and go for it but i think she still would have beaten me i could have given myself a better chance but she was faster than me maybe it's a stupid question but also would it have been almost too much too soon? Given all the, you know, you got a hell of a lot of attention for this for the silver medal. A gold would have, you know, we, I'd be talking to Dame Elizabeth Ar- Armistead now probably. Um, would it would it almost have been? I'm sure you don't, you know, you wouldn't, you would never regret winning a gold medal. But might it have just been too much too soon? Yeah, maybe, possibly. I mean, I like the journey that I've been on. I've got a lot of silver medals in my career. I've, you know, Commonwealth Games was a silver and until I turned it into gold. And there is something about that. There is a silver lining to a silver medal. You still have that motivation. And, yeah, London was huge as a British athlete, and it definitely um, took its toll. The following year, I was absolutely shattered because I'd just not experienced that kind of thing before. So it was a valuable experience having before becoming world champion. I was in the the press conference there, and, and you know you you did make a few points about women's racing, the status of women's racing. I think Pat McQuaid had had been there at the start, and you know they were all very valid points delivered in your very understated way. But because of the the Olympic Games and the effect that has on amplifying everything that's that said, you were it was a big story for a few days, particularly you know before all the gold medals started coming. Um, how was that experience for you? Was that something that you didn't particularly enjoy? Definitely, yeah. I wasn't prepared for it at all. I was not media trained. I was young. I didn't expect any of that stuff. So I remember actually being in a taxi and calling 
with my mum at home and being in tears because I'd read something on a newspaper and I'd, it had totally been taken out of context what I'd said and um, I just wasn't used to it, I didn't know how to handle it but I'm still, I stand by what I said and I'm happy I said it because I do think it brought um, a couple of things out in the open mm. and um, yeah, I suppose that's who I am, I'm not very good at uh, sugarcoating things and yeah, it's, it's easier to be bland actually and to be boring in the media because it's less stressful and you don't get misquoted as much but um, again in my position as world champion I think it's important that I do speak out about stuff if I think that it can help. So it's clear that Lizzie Armitstead doesn't really like being the centre of attention though she accepts the responsibility that comes with being world champion. So how does she deal with media attention? Has she developed strategies? Yeah I don't read stuff anymore. <laughs> I don't uh, read over an interview if I've done it uh, afterwards or I probably won't listen to this afterwards um, just because you know, you can get to... It's a distraction, I guess. Yeah, it's a distraction. And once, you know, once it's been written, you can't change it anyway. And the way social media is and things like that these days, you just don't get, don't get drawn into it because there's always going to be critics and mm. it's easier to criticise than it is to say something positive. So, you know, the people that know me know what I'm really like and it doesn't bother me too much if I get misquoted anymore. Also, I guess you'll know, you know, if, if you're on that platform in Rio, um, you'll know the, the, the sort of Olympic effect, that amplification that I mentioned, and, and, and be aware of it. But as you say, um, you wouldn't presumably want to come across as a, a bland and, you know, very much on-message athlete, would you? No, definitely not. Um, I think it's important to have personality and be yourself. Um, but I totally understand why people do become like that, because it is easier sometimes. Um it's a fine line, especially when you're talking about uh, subjects like feminism, because um, it's a very difficult sort of subject to talk about positively. And that's yeah. I, I do think I'm quite a positive person, and I wouldn't like to sort of moan or anything like that. I, I'm positive and I'm a realist, you know. Yeah. I think there are huge steps that still need to be taken in women's cycling, and I understand the reasons why there's not that huge investment, you know. Nevertheless, even since 2012, and you, you, when you made those comments, I'm not suggesting a link here, but th there have been great developments mm -hmm. in, in women's cycling, um, and, and more planned in 2016 with the Women's World Tour. You know, to, so to speak positively, are you, are you encouraged um, by what's happened? Can you see a real sea change there? Oh yeah, every year gets better, definitely. Um, and... I can't see it stopping. There's real momentum at the moment in the women's side of the sport. And, yeah, the women's world tour should be good. Um, I'd probably reserve judgment on it until we've had a year of it because you just don't know whether the promises made will happen. So hopefully, fingers crossed, it'll have an impact. And in the racing, you know, I mentioned Mariana Voss. She was, for many years, so dominant. Um, you know, you couldn't help but admire her as an athlete, but races could be quite predictable as well. There seems to have been a real levelling off there in terms of the, the quality there are quite a few riders now who can win races on on different types of terrain is that because Voss has lost a bit of her edge or is it because the others have caught up I think it's a combination I think the fact that women's cycling is becoming more professional allows more female athletes to train properly mm. to be full-time athletes is um, you know has a huge impact yeah Voss has obviously suffered with illness and Ill injury the last two years um so it's difficult to tell really but I think um, there's, a, like you say the, the talent is spread a lot more now the, the talent and the people that can win is a lot deeper so I'm excited for her to come back into racing and see what happens Is she still the one that you would fear the most or do you not fear your rivals? <laughs> Good question uh, Do I fear my rivals? I try not to um, but I think about them when I'm training you know I think has Voss got up today and trained as hard as I have? Has Anna van der Breggen trained as hard as I have today? At the moment, I, Voss doesn't come into my mind as much as she used to, no, because she's just not been there, so it's difficult. I, did, I, mean, I would never underestimate Marianne Voss, never. Um, she's an incredible athlete and more so incredibly... Versatile? Or? No, strong-willed, strong you know, strong-willed. Yeah. Uh, you know, her will to win is incredible, so... It'll be interesting to see what she does when she comes back. Mm. 
Um, you, you talk about control a lot, and, and you know, in, in the context of the race in, in Richmond, you, you said you felt in control. I think a lot of people watching it wouldn't have shared your your confidence. You know, it seemed to be quite a chaotic race in a way. Um, but you seem to be concerned, in particular with a couple of riders, Bronzini and Dur, um, and and you know, you're, you you were as long as they were eliminated, you felt more confident. But as breaks were going away and and as you seem to make your your effort um towards the finish quite early um is that is that just with hindsight that you look back and go i was in control i mean can you honestly say that during the race itself you felt that i can honestly say that that is exactly what i planned to happen yeah um so in the training previous to the world championships i'd done the last climb is called governor street um, my plan was to attack on Governor Street and then sprint again. I'd done it in Plouay very similarly mm. and it had worked um, and I wanted to do exactly the same thing in Richmond. So I, in training the week before the World Road Race Championships, I did sprint up Governor Street and sprint over the finish line just without the crowds there. So I li- literally replicated that in the race. And yet, when you crossed the line, you looked surprised. You know, the hand up to the mouth, you looked shocked. Was that... So it wasn't a surprise that we were seeing there. What were what were we seeing? Just like, wow, I've done it, I think. That's that was the emotion. Um it's just it was like a cliff edge, just such a bizarre feeling. Um because I'd focused on it so much, you know, missing out in Pomferrada, it all it was all I'd been thinking about. So I didn't wanna believe it until I'd actually crossed the line, you know. I'd not tempted fate by thinking about it, not thought about a celebration or any of that stuff, so yeah, I didn't get my hands in the air, unfortunately. This is straight out of Steve Peters' uh, sort of uh, <laughs> book of, you know, how not not to think beyond the actual finish line, not to think about the outcome, but to think about the process. Is he is he somebody that you've ever spoken to? Oh, I've, I've sat in seminars, yeah. Um, but sports psychology is not something I've ever really used. Um, I suppose the thing that I took from his seminars was logic over emotion, and that's why I try to apply as much as possible. Um, but a lot of it's yeah, common sense and perspective on the fact that it's just a bike race. So you know, Eurosport, the home of cycling. Lucy Garner, still a developing talent who will be riding in support in some races this year, I imagine, for Georgia Bronzini and Yolene Dur, her teammates. But I asked her about her own goals for 2016. Um, personally the Tour of Britain that's yeah the Aviva Tour that's a real big goal of mine I think last year I really enjoyed a lot of the courses and I had a nice result but I wasn't on the form that I wanted to be so I hope that I can perform well also the national championships it's not well I've heard that it's not very very hilly so that would be um, a big target and of course the Worlds as well in Qatar that's something I think that can sort of benefit me as well obviously Rio being next year so I'd really hope to aim for that We talk a lot about you know how how we can improve our coverage of, of women's racing um, what what are the things what are the things that you know imagine you were UCI president what, what would be the three things that you would say would really help the sport and, and, and lift it up uh, lift it up more Obviously just the main one like the publicity around it I think that it I think that's the really important thing just showing different races okay it doesn't have to be all the races but I think at the moment or like in the past years it's just the world championships and that's just one race in the year and it's completely different to how we race the whole year and it, yeah it's, it doesn't sort of represent what what we are as sort of a as a group of cyclists so I think that's something that yeah it has to push and of course it's nice to have the the re- the sort of big races like racing on the Champs-Élysées I think it does really help and obviously we get the crowds from the men's there and then they can really see what we can do and, and how we can race and I think just things like that it really pushes it and you get more of a bigger fan base and then obviously people get more involved and have more interest and then know a bit more about the racing and everything so I read somewhere that you would love there to be a women's Pyro Bay yeah yeah I think it would yeah it's really cool like I'm not sort of known as a rider to like that sort of racing, but like I remember doing Flanders my first year and I loved that. It was like, yeah, I finished last. I remember I finished last, but it was just, you're just on these roads that are so well known and it's just really nice to be to be there racing. 
So that's Lucy Garner's dream, A Woman's Pyro Bay. Let's now hear for a final time from Lizzie Armistead. I asked her whether she trains with her fiancé, Team Sky rider Philip Degnan, but started by asking about her big aim for the year, the Olympic road race in Rio, which is on a tough, hilly course. She's been out to Brazil to wreck it. So I asked her if the course is as tough as everyone is saying. It's brutal. There's nothing nice or easy about it. The person who wins the Olympic road race will be the strongest. There's no tactics involved. It's literally just going to be, for me, hanging on as long as possible and, and descending as fast as possible and getting into Rio. It'll be a completely different sort of scenario to, to Richmond then where you were trying to eliminate Bronzini, Dour. There'll be people in Rio trying to eliminate you, yeah. I guess. So it'll, it'll change the way that you approach the race. Um, who are Who are those people? <laughs> Uh, the American team are very strong. Well, obviously they're not being selected, but I would suspect they, w- they would select people like Megan and Evie, my teammates, and then Mara Abbott. She's won the Giro. She's an out-and-out climber. Um, then the Dutch, uh, the French. So, yeah, they will be trying to drop me, like you say, on the climb. But my, I suppose it's nice for me just knowing that all I have to do is hang on. Because I am the fastest of mm. those people that can climb, so I've just got to hang on and limit my losses as, as best as I can. And what, uh, presumably, it puts more of an emphasis for you this year on improving your climbing. What are you doing to that end when you're devising your your training programs? What's what? What are you, is it? Just more climbing? Is it losing weight? What's the what's the plan? Uh, well, I suppose the simplest sort of example of what I'm doing is. There's a hilly way home and there's a flat way home when I'm training and I haven't taken the flat road home in 2016 yet. So I'm just trying to stick as much climbing as I can in. It's as as much mentally really getting used to climbing and not fearing climbs, you know, spending as much time as I can in the mountains really. Your fiancé is a, is a good climber. Um, do, do you ever train with him? Do you ever ride with him at all? No, it's better for us not to. <laughs> I mean, we, we have done uh, the odd the odd time and I'll meet him for a coffee on a ride but yeah he is just a pure climber and he just doesn't understand that for a sprinter ish mm. rider like me then the climbs are really difficult and he just can't get his head around it. well beyond the physical thing I mean what you know presumably there's a there's a mental aspect to it too can a pure climber give you any tips advice yeah he's been really good actually um with the training that I've been doing um because I suppose I've gotten so used to being so focused on punchy power mm. that I try and do a 30 minute climb at the power that I can do a 10 minute climb and he you know, advises me I need to take that top end power off a little bit and mm. get used to just riding in that sort of zone under that under the red line really. But yeah I guess the consistency of the effort I'm you know, thinking even you know, Cavendish in Copenhagen it wasn't exactly a, a hilly course but there was a climb on it and, and the way that you manage your effort you know and especially in a circuit race you know every every little effort you make counts doesn't it and if you can find are you going to get out to Rio again before the Olympics or no so I've got um, my power files and I've got videos yeah. from Rio and to be honest it's pretty scorched into my brain I've, I've not forgotten it so what are you more, more motivated by is it is it winning or or not losing hmm which provokes a stronger emotion Probably not losing, but I don't know if Steve Peters would think that's a good thing or not. <laughs> I don't Never know. Never mind Steve Peters. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I am not losing. Yeah, I hate the thought of losing. Have you been able to, given that, have you been able to enjoy, you know, looking back at the world title and, and, and basking in that a little bit? Yeah, but funnily enough, I'd, I'd like to win another one and then I'd know that I need to enjoy it more because... You're just thrown into this madness after a world title. Uh, you just become so busy. Um, and I really miss riding my bike. Um, it was so nice when I started riding again, just to have that quiet time on my bike away from all that kind of the circus that goes on about wearing a rainbow jersey. So I think I would like to win it a second time in order to be able to choo- pick and choose a little bit more what I did and enjoy it a bit more. The Telegraph Cycling Podcast. Brought to you by Trainer Road, cycling's most effective training tool. Pair your power meter with over 800 workouts and 80 training plans to make you a faster cyclist. 
Visit trainerroad.com forward slash TCP to try Trainer Road risk free for 30 days. You heard there our long Trainer Road jingle, and earlier in this show, that of Eurosport. Thanks very much to both Trainer Road and Eurosport for their continued sponsorship of the cycling podcast. A quick plug before we finish for our new Friends special, which was released last week. It's a look back at the rise and demise of the team of the century. The full story on what happened to HTC High Road, a team that dominated the sprint finishes at least from 2008 to 2011. There are exclusive interviews with Bob Stapleton, Brian Holm, Mark Cavendish and Rolf Aldag, as well as Daniel Freib, Lionel Burney and me reflecting on what made the team so successful and picking over the bones of their untimely demise at the end of the 2011 season. It's 90 minutes long and for anyone who's followed the sport in the last decade, I must listen. It's £10 to sign up as a friend of the podcast for 2016 and that will get you access to 11 Friends specials fully downloadable on your mobile device. This HCC High Road special is number two with one on Chris Froome released in January. Finally, a big thank you this week to Lizzie Armistead and Lucy Garner for giving so freely of their time. A lot of you have asked for more coverage of women's racing this year and it is something we are keen to do watch this space i'll be back next week with lionel burney and daniel freeb in the meantime thank you for listening you've been listening to the telegraph cycling podcast thank you to glass pair for the music in this episode for more information and to download more editions of the show visit thecyclingpodcast.com